Good afternoon. Ooh, it's loud. Welcome to the, this book event for the fire this time. And as many of you have seen, we are, uh, the UVA bookstore is selling these books for a 10% discount. For, uh, they'll take credit card, cash, and something else. What else do you take? The food stamps? <laughs> potato, potato. They take potato. Sorry, I'm not a student here. So welcome to the, the event. This event is, uh, my name is Tony Lin. I'm the managing director of the Institute for Advanced Studies in Culture and uh, here at UVA, and we are hosting this event with the generous uh, support from our co-sponsors, the, the Office of Diversity and Equity, uh, the Department of American Studies, the Carter G. Woodson Institute for African, Americans, African, American and African Studies, the American Center, and the English Department. The, the, the Institute for Advanced Studies in Culture is an interdisciplinary research institute that's dedicated to study cultural change and its implications on individuals and society. And race, obviously, it's a huge, um, it's a huge factor that, that has shaped this country from the very inception. And it's a, it's a challenge that, um, that refuses to go away. Mm. And so at the, at the Institute, we have a, a project called the Race, Faith, and Culture Project. And it is a project that's looking at the way that, that race and faith have interacted and, and shaped each other in this country. And that's why there's, uh, I think it's, it's, it's perfect that we're, we are uh, hosting the Fire This Time event because I can't think of a better writer than James Baldwin to embody what we're trying to do in, with the Race, Faith, and Culture Project, especially his book, The Fire Next Time, which deals directly with race and faith, right? Especially the, the second essay, if you, if you read it. And so we are honored to have our uh, uh, two contributors to this, uh, to this wonderful volume, edited by a National Book Award winner, Jasmine Ward. Uh, our first guest is Emily, well, not first, but one of our contributors, contributors is Emily Rabato. She is a professor of creative writing at uh, City University as part of the CUNY system in New York. And she is an award-winning author. Her latest book, Searching for Zion, was the winner of the 2014 American Book Award. And the paperback, if you get the paperback of this book, one of my favorite, my favorite artist probably is on the cover. Mm -hmm. Maurice's favorite, you know, do you know who it is? The, the paperback, he has uh, Kihenti Wiley art on the, on the cover. The, uh, the second contributor is Garnett Cadigan. Garnett is a visiting fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture, so he's, he's been with us since last year, and he'll be with us when he's here another year. <laughs> uh, Garnett's uh, latest uh, accomplishment is that he was, he was an editor-at-large of Nonstop, Nonstop Metropolis, the New York City Atlas, published by the University of California Press. And he's, the, the piece that he has included in this, uh, in this volume, uh, it's black and, called Black, originally it's titled Black and Blue, right? But it, went, it was published as Walking While Black, and it went viral over the summer. So many of you probably, probably read it as Walking While, while Black. And our, the, to, to guide us through this conversation, uh, Professor Maurice Wallace, he is part of the, uh, professor at the uh, English department here at UVA and also associate director of the Carter G. Woodson Institute for African American and American Studies. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Maurice. Thank you, Tony. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here um, and to share this panel and public conversation with two of my favorite contemporary writers, uh, Emily and Garnett. And of course, we have um, the fortuitous event of the recent publication of The Fire This Time, A New Generation Speaks About Race, edited by Jasmine uh, Ward, as Tony indicated, uh, both Emily and Garnett are contributors to this very um, this this very fine this very fine volume, which takes its title, as you know, as an echo of the that long essay published in 1962 by James Baldwin, and I underscore 
that point because um, because my familiarity with my friendships with both Emily and Garnett are mediated by James Baldwin, um, which is to say that many, many moons ago, <laughs> uh, when I was an assistant professor in my first or second semester um, at Yale, Emily was an undergraduate enrolled in the very first James Baldwin seminar I ever taught. Um, and I'm so happy and excited for her and uh, the career that uh, she has, which, of course, um, Baldwin helped to inspire, in spite of me, I'm sure, as a young, unknowing, naive professor um, who thought he could teach James Baldwin. Uh, no one teaches James Baldwin better than James Baldwin teaches James Baldwin. Um, and then um, um, Garnett was introduced to me by Tony, as a matter of fact, when I learned that Garnett was interested in the subject of walking. It was not a surprise to me. Um, because I, too, had a vague interest in walking, owing in large part to a 1971 film called James Baldwin from Another Place by um, the filmmaker and photographer Sadat Pakai, who followed Baldwin walking through the streets and bazaars of Istanbul, Turkey. And so I began to think about Baldwin as a kind of flaneur figure um, whose walking was also working, uh, though it looked or it appeared as if his sort of meandering uh, throughout the streets of Istanbul was an exercise of leisure. It really was the artist at work. Um, and so Garnett and I began to have some conversations about the meaning of, of walking as raced and racialized subjects. So I'm, I'm very happy to um, call both of them my friends, and I want to publicly congratulate them on the success of, of their work and this incredible trajectory that uh, both of them are on. We are here this afternoon to kind of converse with one another, but um, well aware that you'll be eavesdropping on our conversation at least for um, some portion of it. And then, of course, we um, have been asked to and are happy to invite you to join us into, uh, in, this, in this conversation. I thought I might um, initiate, launch this conversation um, by noting a feature of the contemporary moment and its... Uh, s racial discourse, its, its investments in uh, race matters by noting what I take to be the remarkable condition of racism's everydayness. So as I read the contribution of, of, of Emily and Garnett in the fire this time, I am struck by the ways in which racism in our contemporary moment, which is perhaps not at all extraordinary, um, is so quotidian. It's so everyday that it shows up in an afternoon in New York going across a bridge with one's children. It shows up um, walking uh, in the city of New Orleans or in the city of New York. It's just that every day. Um, and I, I, I thought I might ask uh, Emily and, and Garnett to um, talk a bit with me about that, um, how much of an everyday mundane, I think, um, in your language, even Garnett, banal in the sense of commonness, um, um, our experiences with race and racism are the way in which 
uh, for example, Emily, you could you could pass by murals um, one day and have them be so ubiquitous as to be unseen, unseen, and then the next day sort of recognize, oh, this is very, this is very much a, a visual uh, spectacle on the one hand, and yet common on the other hand, it deserves more attention and more. Um, more, more, um, more text to unpack. So, talk to me if you don't mind about the mundaneness of of race and racism in this in this moment, and whether you think this is a remarkable moment or unremarkable moment in that respect. <clears throat> Thanks for that question. Uh, I'd be happy to talk about the dailiness of racism vis-a-vis <clears throat> -vis the essay that I wrote for this collection, but I also feel I'd be remiss not to begin by publicly thanking my professor, um, <clears throat> who even though I'm now grown, I have a hard time calling by his first name. Professor Wallace may be right that James Baldwin is the best teacher of James Baldwin, but I think after James Baldwin, Professor Wallace is the best <laughs> teacher of James Baldwin, and it is absolutely thanks to that class, um, which maybe some of you may have the benefit of being in, uh, that I can claim to be a writer, um, was inspired to become a writer as a very shy young woman who didn't know that would be my path and journey. I had a, a man who saw that I, I had um, a gift and sent me on my way, largely um, inspired by the words of, of the man that we were reading intensely in that seminar. Um, so I was invited by Jasmine Ward to write an essay for this collection, The Fire This Time, to remark, to remark upon our current moment in light of, uh, inspired by the way that James Baldwin wrote about his moment. And she was feeling very bereft, enraged, tired, um, insane, none of which were terribly new feelings, but which came to the fore for her in the summer of, I want to say, 2014, um, when, thanks to social media, we were getting kind of a lot more attention paid to, not because there were any more deaths taking place, um, at the hands of police officers, but because there was more attention being paid to the ways that they were being, uh, black men in particular, being killed with impunity, um, cops were being exonerated. And she turned to social media, Twitter, to, to vent her anger, um, sadness, rage, and found a, a kind of community there. Um, and then she decided to invite some members of that community who write, and I think all of the writers she invited would describe themselves in some ways as children of Baldwin, insofar as we are inspired by his work um, to take this project on. And then she gave us absolutely no uh, direction other than that. So it was, it was like strangely um, terrifying, although also a real honor to be invited to participate. And so my initial thought as the mother of two very young children, at the time she extended this invitation to me, my children were two and four years old. I thought I'm gonna do like Baldwin did in the fire next time and begin with a, like a brief letter to my children um, and about the ways that I'm afraid for my, my two black children, about the ways that I'm afraid for their, for their lives. And, and my husband, as young as they were at the time, and I were already beginning this conversation of how how do we talk to our children about how to comport themselves around police? Mm. Our son in particular, um, who is a, a headstrong toddler, right? Such that he not invite um, suspicion, uh, violence, death. Uh, so I, 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 I didn't end up writing um, a letter directly to them because I didn't know what to say yet. They're still so small. And I didn't, I, I hadn't figured out the words. But I was mulling over the desire to do that one day when I was walking with them in our upper Manhattan neighborhood of Washington Heights. It's just one neighborhood north of Harlem where I teach. And uh, 
I was surprised to discover a mural that I hadn't noticed uh, in the landscape before, although it had been there for a while. And it was right next to a laundromat, in fact, on the route that I take my children to daycare every day. And it said, know your rights. And, um, and then it, it, it listed uh, some of the Fourth Amendment had the Miranda rights in both English and Spanish, which is the predominant language in the neighborhood that I live in. Um, and it showed some people who look like the people who live in my neighborhood holding up cell, phone, uh, cell phones. Um, and it said, you have the right to film uh, police act and record police activity. And I thought, oh, wow. And it's a beautiful mural. It's very large. And it's largely. Um, blue and it, and it kind of splashes out in the landscape of, of the neighborhood, which is largely kind of gritty and gray. It's just like a beautiful piece of artwork um, that I just hadn't noticed. I'd passed by it and um, it struck me as just a thing of beauty um, as I wrote on the gallery of the street because it had been created for the people who live in the neighborhood just to say, here's some of the ways that you are allowed to behave. Here's some of the things you can do to protect yourself, acknowledging that when you are walking, as Garnet wrote about beautifully in his essay and continues to write about in space as a black body, you, we want to acknowledge that you are endangered. And here are some of the things that you can do. Um, it's very s sad to me that this is banal, right? But that there needs to be instruction like that. And that somebody had taken the care as an artist to deliver instruction like that, but in a beautiful um, mode like that's not a that's not a mural you would see as I write in my essay um, on Fifth Avenue, right? It was expressly made to be in in this neighborhood where I live, which is predominantly a, a neighborhood of people of color, um, many of whom are subject to stop stop were subject to stop and frisk. Um, Anyway, so that's a little bit about, you know, it's like I, I then discovered this was one of many murals throughout New York City um, across four of the five boroughs in the poorest neighborhoods where um, people are most subject to police misconduct. And uh, I went and visited all of them that I could and photographed them kind of uh, just because they made me feel um, a sense of solace and appreciate deep appreciation and gratitude as an expression of grace in a hard world. And also, um, finally, I want to say something about uh, the sad banality of being a mother, a mother of black children, the fear, the fear that you have when you let them out into the world, even when you are as, as privileged a person as I am as a university professor who herself has light skin privilege and, and, can, and can pass quite um, easily through space. I, ha I carry this fear from my children um, who read who read as black, my son in particular. And that is a very, very common um, normal feeling for, for the mother a mother of black children. Um, and and uh, it's insane that that's a common feeling that you know when I when I let my children out the door, it's it's not just to say, as I also write in the essay, you know, put on your coat. It's also with this like ticker tape in my brain of what, what do I need to say to them when they reach a certain age, and what is that certain age? What I need to say to them about how to how to be safe, living where we live, um, walking as they will, encountering what they will. I'm like that busybody child you have to worry about that can't keep still, that's forever moving and shifting and moving around. And I came here as that busybody that, as I hit new streets. And f in a run around in search to see what revelations are there on those streets. And so I see the streets as this radiant space in which there are all these enriching encounters waiting to happen. And I want to participate in as many of them as, as I can. It was a strange thing that sort of pushed me on those streets. But from a very young age, I found that there were all these private pleasures to be had in a public space. And some forever in search of those. And so I was used to doing that, you know, back in Jamaica, with you know, just thinking in more of crime that I'd always have to control in many ways, or you know, be aware of other people's 
behavior mm -hmm. and always be alert as to how they're behaving to be street smart and so I never ever thought about the mundanity or the banality mm. of you know racism or racial tensions mm -hmm. racial prejudice but then when I entered the environment here like sat living in the US which has been two decades now I recognized that it wasn't sufficient for me to be street smart by being aware of other people's behavior I suddenly had to think on deep self-consciousness of my own behavior mm. so along with anticipating their behavior I just had anticipating ways in which they would anticipate my behavior and so the the things that supposedly were you know commonplace and banal and mundane took on levels of complexity and <coughs> even frustrations that previously were unbeknownst to me um, it then I mean one of the fascinating things is we're moving more and more and more people seem more afraid of each other to mm. the point where as a friend said to me recently that Americans are even afraid of their own shadows and Americans saying this to me and I s started behaving in a way in which I think I started behaving like I was afraid of my own shadow or rather afraid of the ways in which my shadow not to mention me would then cause others to fear and so the private pleasures were clipped time and again because of the ways in which you know rather than spontaneity or you know and their kind of randomness that they come from spontaneity the busybody in me that was you know rushing to spontaneity mm -hmm. started moving in a more controlled manner started recognizing that spontaneity you know had its dangers and so it was a lot more controlled a lot more self-conscious um, more self-consciousness than self-possessed in public space and so those private pleasures you know were always hemmed in by that awareness that you know the public space itself didn't give the full freedoms of the commonplace that mm -hmm. I you know previously was aware of and so that led partially to the essay that I r wrote or rather gave to Jasmine initially I was going to write about riots and I thought that walking was the most potent form of public protest I mean, part of it was a kind of arrogance coming from Jamaica that I thought that <laughs> I was, I mean, my first heroes were superheroes as a kid. That people who were protesting, like you'd leave school and say, oh, there's a protest, there's a strike for the increase in gas prices. And you'd blink and I have no clue how they did this. But there were six burnt out cars, like blocking the street and you're like, no human could have possibly done that. They're superhuman. Mm -hmm. So the protesters in Jamaica are superhuman. Mm -hmm. and you know they're always gunshots ex in a, in a exchanged and they're you know pretty violent and then of course the images I was used to seeing were either documentaries or old historical I mean images of the civil rights movement in America you know or I grew up watching this in real time the student protest movements from South Africa and anti-apartheid movement in South Africa especially but you know elsewhere so when I came to college here and people were having sit-ins at the president's office and they'd leave to go have lunch and come back, I was like, this is a joke. <laughs> like, there's no blood at stake. I mean, <laughs> how is this a protest? You can leave and go have lunch. <laughs> if you're starving, then you could get some of my sympathy. But I mean, <laughs> come on, really? Um, and so there is this, you know, lack of sympathy in my part and this arrogance that I thought, okay, there's no skin in the game, so it's not really a protest. Um, or critical mass on bicycles. It's like you can ride away from getting punched. I mean, this occasional person gets smacked off a bike like that terrible one the police had done in mm -hmm. New York City a couple of years ago. But I thought, you know, it's critical mass. You know, protest by bicycle, it's comical. Sit-ins, it's a waste of time. Letter writing, forget it. Mm -hmm. Walking, it's like, you know, it wasn't a motorcade, you know, um, Selma, and, you know, Montgomery. It was walking. So walking was you know, the potent form of protest. And, and so I sort of was viewing it from the sidelines you know, rather than somebody you know, you know, actually who would even participate in a protest. And so initially I was going to write about that for Jasmine, but as I started working on it, I you know, developed more and more sympathy and recognized 
you know, just like a bit how obnoxious I was, mm -hmm. but you know how arrogant about the whole thing. Though I still believe that walking was the most potent form of protest. But as I started working it, I recognized there are all these cases that seem to so many people to be extraordinary. Um, you know, so much so that names became a standing for these, you know, you know, awfulness. You know, you know, Walter Scott or Trayvon Martin, you know, Sandra Bland and you know Tamir Rice, and it went on and on. But I also recognized that they sort of were pushed to abstraction. They started feeling like these little dots here connected, and in each case, you know, I felt you know it was different. Even though there are different parallels, there there are ways in which someone said, "Okay, we can say clear culpability." That here it's more controversial. Others, you know, we don't know. And so I thought, why not write about something in which people aren't having debates about, you know. You know whether this happened or not happened, whether we are, can be sure of culpability or not. Why not write about cases that are not so heated that people you know get thrown up? And then of course for some people, Black Lives Matters was a proposition. Um, for others, it was a movement in which they had arguments with. And so I wanted to write about something that felt so commonplace, so mundane, so normal that all of us take for granted, that it became a way to talk about something we could sort of find in a, a huge common ground around mm -hmm. and we move away from the abstraction move away from the the contra controversy but in a shine a mic you know like put a microscope over it and said here's what the normal day-to-day -day experience is like for the average black person mm -hmm. and so i thought why not walk in you know it's so commonplace i mean it's something we all you know take for granted and you know, if we don't do it something you know you know, celebrate and just think of us, you know, what could there really be, to be said about walking? Apart from, oh, Thoreau did it, Wordsworth did it, it's nice, it's good for mm -hmm. you, it makes you healthy, it's fun. Um, and so I, you know, abandoned SL's got the initial ride for uh, Jasmine. Well, I was forced to abandon it. Jasmine, you know, was asking for this and I kept saying no. And I went back and I said, actually, I think I'll do this and make a few small touches mm -hmm. to the origins that I had and have this essay which I had written earlier for John Freeman for this literary journal Freeman's to say you know, here is what the normal daily commonplace experience is like and here is this simple thing we take for granted but by looking at it closely it becomes a way of showing us a sharp difference mm. in, a, in a between our, the way our lives are lived so so um, Garnet, I want to ask you a question but I don't want you to answer it just yet um, I want to come back to it um, you you mentioned you you evoked invoked um, the Black Lives Matter movement and the word movement and protest and march gets all evoked in my imagination when we invoke that um, that that phenomena right that political phenomena that social phenomena and I'm actually wondering whether you imagine a relationship between walking and the street protest, walking and the march, walking and um, the collective movement of people who have assembled under a shared banner um, that reads Black Lives Matter or No Justice, No Peace or something along those, those lines. I, I, I kind of want to ask about the, the physical movement of black bodies in mass throughout space but um, there's another qu there's another sort of awareness I've suddenly come to in hearing the two of you talk about your about your project and that is the shared identification you have as writer in this moment so Emily you are a mother concerned for her children in this historical moment and yet simultaneously you are called upon as writer. So in some respects, I, I, I think of you then as mother writer, right? Mm -hmm. You are a walker. You are a walker writer. And so I'm interested in the role now that the writer plays in this historical moment. The thing that connects the two of you is this, is this craft. Um, Jessmine called upon you not because she heard a speech that she could record on a podcast, um, um, but precisely because 
the two of you are committed to writing as craft, writing as art. Um, you write fiction. Um, you write nonfiction prose. I write a different form of prose, which is academic prose. Um, and I wonder about our roles as writers in, I mean, what brings us together today is, in fact, that we share a commitment to writing in one way or another. And I, I guess I'm trying to think aloud, wonder aloud about the role, say, of the writer slash artist um, in a way, given the introduction to Jessamine's volume, um, she, she says that she found community in social media, and yet she describes social media as an ephemeral form. So she needed words, and she needed words that would be a little bit more, um, a little more per permanent. And so she called on Emily, and she called on Garnett. And in that respect, I, I sort of see the work you do as historical work. Um, historical not least because the subtitle is A New Generation Speaks About Race. So this is an assertion perhaps of history with a difference, if you imagine that the, uh, that the generation to which you belong has something slightly different than the previous one to say, or alternately, if the new generation is filling a silence that um, had not been sort of, um, had not been given voice to um, until now, or or that there's such a dearth of writing about this that it became all the more urgent for Jessamine to collect these these essays. So I'm wondering, maybe in in, in light of the uh, the role of the artist that 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 Baldwin sort of gave voice to, I wonder if you see what you have contributed as um, much uh, the uh, reflex of the writer as the mother, as much the thought of the writer as the walker. What, what's, who is the writer in all of this? What is, what are we supposed to be doing? Maybe with your permission, I could start by talking about um, rhetorical strategy, um, narrative points of view mm. in in essays, and this is something that I learned actually from James Baldwin. We are all multiplicitous people who contain, we contain multitudes. Mm -hmm. Baldwin was many things. He was at one time a child preacher. He was ho a homosexual man. He was a consumer of films. He was a gourmand. He was, you know, he, he was many things, and yet he knew with each of his diamond cut finely wrought essays mm. um, some of which are are short and powerful some of which are long and powerful that you have to wear one hat um, to enter into the essay to be persuasive um, you have to choose which hat your which self should be at the means of your disposal in order to make a persuasive argument to an audience such that they understand your condition, such that they empathize with your condition. For me, for this essay, I was the mother who was concerned about her children. Mm. And my belief and hope was in choosing that hat um, that other parents, whether or not they are parents of black children, would understand my fear and my pain in a way that would make them care or lean in um, rather than feel they were being yelled at or complained to. Um, and if I was successful in that essay, it is because I exposed something of my heart as a mother mm. such that I touched the hearts of others who are parents, who know what it is to be um, mm. loving and concerned for their children. And I'll say that I think what made Garnett's um, essay, as, as Tony mentioned, it really went viral, was that it was so rhetorically simple. His um, choice as a writer, as he's just spoken about, 
was to be a walker in space. And most of us, unless we have some um, disability that makes perambulation difficult for us um, or different for us, understand the experience of walking in space. And yet Garnet's experience of walking in space as, as a black man might be different from, from others who are not going to be perceived as um, threatening or uh, a problem or, uh, or objectified, right? But he wrote so simply about the, the desire to move from point A to point B, the desire to feel free in that movement. Um, and he wrote very convincingly of the ways in which his movement is restrictive. Um, and he wrote about it very simply and very beautifully in ways that any of us who walk and many of us who walk who might also have our walking um, problematized per perhaps because we are women and are objectified for other reasons. Um, perhaps because we are disabled and, 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 and walking is difficult for other reasons, may lean into the way that Garnet talks about um, the particular way in which he moves through space and, um, and empathize with it. Mm. You said Emily writes um, fiction, but I kind of want to be like Emily when I grow up. Um, she does choice fiction and novels, yeah. short stories, essays, journalism, mm -hmm. um, wear of many hats. And I think that allows her to do something the way many writers working as they should, that allows them to do that. I mean, I, I'm amazed at how many times I start a piece thinking, those idiots. And somewhere in the middle of the essay, I'm like, I'm such an idiot. <laughs> 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 that you know, was it was it Augustine Pascal, one of those um, old, brilliant um, religious writers, who said, um, "I write in order to understand." Mm -hmm. um, you know, or the the old. I mean, it happens to me time and again. Someone said, well, "What are you going to write?" I said, "I, I don't know. I'll have to wait until I start writing. I'll mm -hmm. figure it out." Mm -hmm. I'm writing in order to figure out what I actually believe. Mm -hmm. So, one of the wonderful things about writing is that done properly, it reminds you of how irreducibly complex we all are. That one of the things about this new generation, it, it reminds you that we're in such a complicated time that, I mean, as rich and you know, you know, amazingly relevant Baldwin is, you know, for our times and, you know, all the times that have succeeded him since he's written, that there, you know, you know, the world that we live in now is not the world that Baldwin lived in. Mm -hmm. There are ways in which it's more pluralistic. There are ways in which questions which are pressing then pressing us with in a difference now. I mean, for example, we're in the midst of the election season now where one of the big questions pressing on us is like, how do we coexist with each other? How do we live with differences? What does it mean to live with people who look, think, you know, believe things differently from you? And so one of the things you know, being a new generation, a writer in this current generation, is to you know respond to or ask questions that are part of the, the zeitgeist. Ask questions you can only mm. ask that are if you're part of that moment, and then to respond in a way that shows irreducible complexity within that context. And so it's very easy to have sloganeering, and it's very easy to have you know even these short terms that sometimes we think we're speaking the same language that we're not sure what it means, you know, some of these words that have become so protean. So even the word privilege, you know, in a common amount of seven people, most of seven people, you know, might you know, have seven different things and they think they're, they're talking about the same things. And so sometimes a writer's responsibility is also to, to peel away the understandings behind language or mm -hmm. to use language afresh or anew, but all with the service of saying, this is how amazingly complex and joyful and frustrating and complicated the world is because we're irreducibly complex. And so the responsibility as a writer you know, in writing about race and writing about these other things is to, I mean, is to, to show the complexity. But one of it also is, you know, especially about me and Emily, you know, being writers who are black. I mean, you know, you know we know this, I mean, you know this, the, you know, what they call the phenomenon of guess who's coming to panel, <laughs> um, where you know, there's such a thing as like the black force. I said, we want the black perspective. And so, you know, the marvelous thing about, you know, Jensen's book is to say, well, there's no such thing as the black perspective. Mm -hmm. 
in a in a in a in a in a multiple there are many black perspectives. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you walk through like a place like Harlem for instance and like, oh it's a black neighborhood or you know, it's it's black New York. So well, you know, there's even one block on Western Harlem alone. You know, you knock on fifteen there are fifteen households and it's fifteen different sort of presentiments and ambitions and frustrations. I mean even in one family, I mean I mean what is it now? October? Mm-hmm. Thanksgiving mm-hmm. is around the corner. If mm-hmm. you if you doubt me, just go to Thanksgiving dinner. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, the writer's purpose during this time is to to help sort of pull us back and to sort of peel away what is sort of either the abstraction or the tiredness or the clichéness of language, which has veered into becoming a slogan, and remind us afresh of what we actually do look like or what do, what a certain slice of the world can look like, and how multitudinous and complicated it is and how irreducibly complex we all are. I am thinking a little bit more now about this subtitle, A New Generation Speaks About Race. And initially I was interested in the new, the generational difference, if if one existed, that distinguished you from um, from earlier generations of 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 writers, um, but now I'm, I'm I'm as interested in this in race because I think in the contemporary discourse, when we're talking about race, we really mean this anti-black moment or this anti-black historical trend because. To talk about an anti-black moment is somehow to distinguish it from some earlier moment that wasn't anti-black, right? Um, and so I, I, I want to acknowledge that and, 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 and maybe have us think a little bit about the specificity of race in our contemporary, in our contemporary moment or to invite you to be um, that Baldwinian witness, right? What do you see around the matter of of race and anti-blackness? Um, how do you respond not only as an artist, but how do you respond at the visceral level to what you see, what's happening around us? What, um, you know, the way in which um, and, and Emily, you had this beautiful phrase, uh, beautiful sentence in your essay about the seriality of these episodes, these encounters, these violent encounters of unarmed black men with the police. And you said everyone, um, something like this, that everyone is um, uh, a kind of, uh, what, was that, what was that phrase? It, it was sequential like um, the images of my bridge, of, of my bridge horses galloping and that, and those of us who know anything about the history of visual culture that will be a familiar sort of a sort of image but but I guess I'm you know I'm 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 equally interested in um in what you see as a witness to all of this beyond the particular uh beyond the particular conditions that inspired your your respective pieces so there are murals, of course, that you recognize abruptly. Um, there are uh, you, you become more self-aware, Garnett, as you're walking through the streets of New Orleans or the or the, or the streets of Manhattan. Um, but if you could if you could widen your scope a bit, um, what else do you do you see? Um, I might, for example, I might, for example begin to give voice to what I see as a very grievous um, uh, I mourn for children I'll put it that way that I see childhood as a very precarious stage in the life the lives of children of color that childhood is a stage nearly robbed of children of color. When I think of Tamir Rice, when I think of so many children who who are who are imagined to be um, already adults, um, who are 
confronted with circumstances that we wouldn't even wish on adults um, and yet are very much regarded in in that light I, I, I think that um, I recognize that across the the national landscape um, and I might be meandering here a bit but um, uh, that that's you know in order to give you some latitude to um, sort of approach the approach the question or the series of questions in in the way that seems to suit you suit you best so to the degree that you imagine you can imagine yourself as witness in this historical moment what are we witnessing what do you see what do you see more clearly now that you did not recognize before and we can take your 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 murals as a as an analogy for for some broader conversation some broader um revelation maybe that um that that you've experienced recently yeah if i understand your questions correctly i think you're you're asking us to speak more broadly beyond the, the kind of particular approaches we took to the mm -hmm. individual essays we wrote for this book um and inviting us to speak a little more um, openly as witnesses in the way that Baldwin was really a witness to his historical moment, also acknowledging that we are being defined as belonging to a different generation. And, and I think um, one of the sad truths of this project is the ways in which the past is not past, right? Mm -hmm. Like that his, his work feels so relevant now because we haven't it feels like we're reliving mm -hmm. we're in a like a nightmare loop or something mm -hmm. in spite of civil rights and he's talking in the fire next time very grippingly um about integration and um and it's sad to feel like we haven't come as far as as the narrative as the narrative would like us mm -hmm. <laughs> to believe um, yeah that's another thing I mourn right so at, at the same moment that we are um, recognizing James Baldwin's genius yeah that he remains so relevant to us is almost a tragedy right um, because it's the changing same so excuse me for interrupting but I just I, I just yeah felt compelled to yeah. recognize that and agree with you on that matter. But, but, your, but your line of questioning is reminding me of another question that Garnet and I received on a panel we spoke on this summer about, about this book in New York City at the Strand Bookstore. There was a young man in the back who asked, what did, Bal he asked, what, what did Baldwin miss? What did Baldwin get wrong? Mm. Or what couldn't Baldwin say? Mm -hmm. Like, what couldn't he see? And I'm not sure we, I feel like we maybe failed him a little bit, but I've been thinking about that question. <laughs> And I, I took it too lightly. I said, well, Baldwin Baldwin wasn't a good poet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he wasn't funny. He was witty, but he wasn't fun. These are some things that like he couldn't he couldn't do. Right. Um But then he came up afterwards to have the book signed and he said, You know, I feel like he didn't he didn't he wasn't either maybe he wasn't capable in his moment in time, but he didn't talk um as much as I think he would have been free to talk about now about what it was to be to be homosexual about about being gay mm -hmm. um, and uh, as if one identity perhaps trumped another couldn't be incorporated fully or freely in his discussion of his multiplicitous self and identity um, and, and maybe and maybe Garnet can talk a little bit too about what what maybe we are able to see or or are called upon to do that Baldwin wasn't or couldn't. Um, one thing I've been giving thought to is the ways in which we need to and are required to extend conversation about um, civil rights and human suffering beyond national borders and make more connections between, for example, um, Black Lives Matter and pa Palestinian Lives Matter. Mm. Um, in some ways, social media enables those kinds of connections. And um, I, I think I've mentioned social media a couple of times, although you were correct, correct to point out the ways in which Jasmine herself recognized the limitations of Twitter. We have 140 characters is not enough to get into any of this stuff. And yet 
and yet we have successfully managed in many ways to um, undercut a single single narrative uh, line that we get through media about what what are stories where should we be turning our gaze and what are the mm. stories that deserve our attention um, that in some ways it seems like p these problems are getting worse because they are getting more exposure and deservedly so um, so that is largely because of citizen journalism mm. and and social media is a, is a platform for that like none we've ever had before yeah. Citizen journalism has been an important, um, an important method uh, in, in liberation struggles um, for social justice since since like the camera began, mm -hmm. um, and yet now we all ha we all walk around with cameras. We all have the possibility or potential to use the camera as a as a force um, to showcase injustices when we might encounter them on the street and. Um, and fight. I mean, one of the things that has happened since I worked on my essay, but also to think, you know, well beyond the essay and some of the other essays in the book, is the pervasiveness of two things. Um, one is denial, and mm -hmm. the second is infantilization. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a sense in which when you're walking, at least for me, and I know people who love walking, that there's a part of you that actually wants to be like a child. You want to be like, I mean, um, it's like that poet, um, wonderful Polish poet, you know, Wisława Sembrowska said, the most urgent questions are the naive one. You want to be that person asking the naive question, go, oh, what's that, you know, what's that sound? Who's there? Why is it like this? Mm -hmm. Why, why? I mean, especially for those of kids. And why, mm -hmm. and why, and why? And mm -hmm. so you sort of want to approach the world with that, and why, and why, and why, on a further loop. And so there's that sense in which you want to be a child. How you don't want to be treated like a child is to be stopped by law enforcement, for example, and to be this equivalent um, of what, what's really compliance is a certain obsequiousness that they're, mm -hmm. they're requiring of you. Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, officer. No. And you, know, the, you, know, you can't think to ask, well, why am I being stopped? Or you know, you know, what have I done? Or, you know, why this line of questioning? Like, anything that is defiance. And so that infantilization, you said there, with is seat in many other fronts. Um, you know, there are people who are experiencing it in, in boardrooms, in classrooms, um, in, in, in so many you know, interactions. This unwillingness to accord you, you know, you know the full range of dignities and you know, human emotions that, you know, they're capable of is it's seen men saying, okay, you know, you know, you know, it's a black guy, he's capable of humor, he's capable of anger. That's about it. Contemplation, um, reflection, you know, so much of these things are, you know, you know, not so, you know, but also in a certain kind of denial in which, you know, it has happened to me time and again where I say, oh, well, this happened. And so it's like, well, that's never happened to me. Um, you sure you didn't do something wrong? You know, you sure you didn't, like, it's as if, like, what did you do to attract this kind of behavior towards you? You know, or, mm -hmm. you know, this has happened to me before, walking alongside and you know, passing a frat house, and someone would think it's funny to throw a banana over the fence and make monkey sounds at me. But then you sort of keep it to yourself because you say to people, and they're like, no, that, that couldn't have happened. Not here. I mean, I've passed that place a million times. I said, well, maybe wear my complexion for a while. Um, mm. um, and so, you know, one of the things that has happened in terms of, you know, beyond my essay is looking at the pervasiveness of denial, the mm -hmm. denial of the horrific experiences. The, you know, sometimes the readiness to say, that's an exceptional thing, that doesn't happen, um, rather than the fact that, you know, for so many people, okay, it happens time and again and again and again, we're just sort of giving up on talking about it because, you know, we're sort of exhausted from having to justify mm -hmm. that, yes, this really did happen mm -hmm. in terms of being called liars, but all the infantilization, infantilization in terms of encounters, but also the infantilization that we're not capable of knowing, you know, when, you know, we're being treated without mm. dignity, when we're being treated horribly. And I think of this part from Baldwin, I mean, I almost think of myself as Baldwin's grandmother, <laughs> as a writer, <laughs> and for this reason. Grandmother, you said? Uh, his mother, I'm oh, sorry, his, his mother. mother. Okay. Um, where he was talking Indeed. to <laughs> his nephew, and he right. said, um, 
in the early part of the Fayan exam where he said, Now, my dear namesake, these innocent and well-meaning people, your countrymen, have caused you to be born under conditions not very far removed from those described for us by Charles Dickens in the London of more than a hundred years ago. I hear the chorus of the innocent screaming, No, this is not true. How bitter you are. But I am writing this letter to you to try to tell you something about how to handle them. For most of them do not yet really know that you exist. I know the conditions under which you were born, for I was there. Mm -hmm. Your countrymen were not there and haven't made it yet. Your grandmother was also there, and no one has ever accused her of being bitter. I suggest that the innocents check with her. Mm. She isn't hard to find. Your countrymen don't know that she exists either, though she has been working for them all their lives. And so sort of see it as you know, that grandmother he speaks of, mm. that part of the responsibility you know, I have is to you know, give account for these things um, and to give account for them in a way that's you know, not rancorous, that's you know, without bitterness, you know, um, sometimes even without anger, even though I think time and again I have grounds for anger. But you know, to, to be done in a way that you know, I can go, oh, but, but here, here is, yeah. you, know, you know, look here. Um, and so the cries of, Ignorance or you know, innocence can be made, and uh, clearly, I mean, you know, I'm writing at a different time than the times that um, Baldwin was right, you know, writing then. I mean, you know, I wouldn't say that you know we're in a Dickensian time, but there are things time and again that make you feel like yeah. you know you've walked into a Dickensian scene, yeah. um, and so I've sort of extended beyond you know you know this essay and the way it has extended beyond my thinking. It's whether it be in a you know, on the streets or in the home or in the boardroom or in politics, just time and time again to try to see ways in which you know, important experiences are being denied and in which you know, you're being infantilized and to sort of roll back um, mm -hmm. to, to say, you know, look here, um, there are no, no, no grounds for denial. And actually, we have a full you know, kaleidoscope of emotions and aspirations and you know, dignities and so, you know, should not be infantilized. Yeah. I, I, I like those responses very much. Um, the power of social media and citizen journalism is distinctive um, to our moment. The ramping up of a kind of denial and infantilization would seem to be no less true. There's another related um, idea, I think, that may also be true, although um, Baldwin certainly gave us a heads up to this. And I, th I think the ways in which we seem to understand now um, um, that whiteness is as much a racial category as blackness, that is to say, the ways that we are more um, comfortable and knowing about denaturalizing whiteness allows us, I think, um, to better name the problem. Um, you know, I can recall on more than one occasion um, Baldwin's sort of repudiation of the idea that there is a Negro problem, to use his language, at all. There is, in effect, he would say, no Negro problem, but you are, in effect, the problem, right? And, and by you, he meant to name uh, a sort of historical consolidation of the presumptions and pretensions of whiteness itself. Um, so that may also be a, a distinctive thing. I don't. I don't want to uh, uh, hog the conversation. There, there's a. There's a. There's only one word that remains that I would have um, loved to spend more time talking about, and it's really a, a word that. Um, Baldwin spoke often of, as did King speak often of, and yet I sort of miss it in our public discourse. Um, I don't know quite where and how to situate it, whether as a society we're even mature enough for um, the, the handling of this word in this contemporary moment, and that's the word love, like love as a politic. I'm really interested in um, that. I have a recollection of, of conversation about forgiveness around um, uh, the families of those who were massacred in Charleston. Um, but I haven't really heard much and really haven't taken notice, recent, take notice recent, until recently 
of the sort of absence of of a language around love and I don't mean love in the sentimental sense I love I mean love in a kind of um, muscular but but not necessarily masculine understanding um, and yet it feels like that is all around and within and between the lines of what you've been saying what you've what you've written here um, I don't know if you if you have any particular thoughts about love's place in our in our contemporary moment but um, I, I'd like to simultaneously open the floor for some questions so that the questions aren't all from me um, let me sure say something for it I mean the lines from Baldwin that shapes my writing more than anything else and for me it's my favorite part in all of Baldwin I mean this is just his book of essays and there's a fiction I mean there's a million things um, was in the early part of the fire next time um, when he said um, it you know he was talking back about the 60s and talking to his nephew a guy named James and he goes it looked bad that day too yes and we were trembling we have not trembling we have not stopped trembling yet but if we had not loved each other, we would not have survived. Mm. And so that, more than anything else, in a shapes, I mean, in terms of a ball and shapes, but it shapes my writing time and mm. time and time and again. Thank you. You know, but in a, you know, but r in a love and especially way in a ball and as envisioned as this wonderfully robust and rich and full and yeah. vibrant and just in a deeply potent thing. Um, which was able, you know, first, you know, not only to make, you know, you know, the case, you know, for ourselves, but made us also able to see the ways in which we were present in each other. So, for example, one of the tasks of my writing, when people talk about race, oh, I want to hear the black perspective. I said, actually, what I'm trying to do is show ways in which you are very much present in me, mm. and the ways in which I'm in present in you, and it's inextricable. I mean, you know, you see it in ball when you see it, I don't know, like Albert Murray, who just had a Library of America writings mm -hmm. just come out recently. Mm -hmm. But in you know, right after right after right after right to and so you sort of push against this idea that okay, so that's a black perspective is to say, no, actually one of the things that I'm doing is showing the ways in which we're all very much present in each yeah, other. Good. Um mm -hmm. and so to I mean it's the old reflection in you know, from Frederick Douglass that one of the horrible things about slavery is that you know, you know, it's this double de degradation. You can't degrade someone else without degrading yourself. Mm -hmm. You can't deny someone's humanity without denying your very humanity. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Baldwin sense, you know, that that it was love that you know allowed us to survive, you know, and that and we were still able to tremble. We were still able to, you know, live in fear, you know, without abandoning love. Yeah, um, is something that you know continually shapes my writing. Excellent. Any questions? Thank you much for the for this wonderful panel. Uh, I love Baldwin. And I think I've just wanted to respond. Um, so, as an elementary student, um, so my dad gave me an adult library card around nine, and, and and I was looking at all of these black authors and all these black titles, and I stumbled on the Giovanni's room around nine, and there's something childlike around room. So I ended up reading this book <laughs> at nine years old. <laughs> Crazy. Um, wow. That's, that's a long time. That's about 30-something years ago now. Um, well, those sex scenes. It, it was intense nine uh, at nine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the, the reason why I'm thinking about this is because when you, you mentioned what did James Baldwin miss, uh, you, you, you respond, Emily, uh, by saying something about miss and couldn't do, I just think it's fascinating that he wrote Giovanni's Room around 52, 50-ish. This is right before Board of, you know, Education, all that stuff, you, you know, Brown versus Board of Education. Yeah. It's crazy that that book was written 60 plus years ago. That's true. And then we have The Fire Next Time, which was written right at the cusp of the civil rights legislation 50 years ago or so. And I, and I just think it's fascinating just to wonder what it would be like if when he was writing Giovanni's Room, there actually was an affinity for intersectionality, which I don't think there was. Yeah. I mean, but now when we reflect on Giovanni's Room, it's probably one of the greatest novels, you know, about same-sex love, same-sex lust. I mean, it's, whatever that is, it's an amazing book. Mm 
It is. I, I just think it's unfortunate that there wasn't an affinity for that intersectionality at the time. Yeah. But I think he would have been extremely productive if there was an appetite for it. I just don't know. That it's unfortunate for us that there wasn't an appetite. But I thought the book was a, a, it's an unbelievably a gift to us. Right yeah, now. I wonder, because is that not where he started? Was that his first novel? Second? And I don't know how it did in terms of sales. There's another element, too. It's more popular now than it was then. Than it was then. Yeah. It's that, I, that would have been my guess, that probably it was not a commercial success. And so he, he had also to learn as a writer, and this is something we must think about as well, how to navigate your subject such that you have an audience are in, uh, and are invited to keep writing, right? Are allowed to keep writing. I think one of the things we can do is refuse or resist uh, reductive analyses that um, delimit the possibilities for understanding, um, that privilege certain subject positions, not just privilege certain subject positions over another, but imagine that the privileging of one subject position necessarily denies another. Um, to be, to, to notice and be as comfortable as we can with the tensions that obtain between um, um, subject positions, um, identities, to acknowledge, as Emily said at the outset, um, evoking Whitman, we are, you know, we are multitudinous. Um, and that some, some less public aspects of ourselves nevertheless are vital to, um, to the formation of our contemporary lives together. Um, and I, I just think we have to be as, what we can do is to be as um, open and available as we possibly can um, to, to voices as yet unheard and to honor those voices. I can say, there are, I mean, there are many answers uh, to that, but I'll just give one short one, which is um, as writers, one of the things we can do is by constantly making many affirmations and denials in the right direction. Mm. So for instance, there's this very prestigious um, book review, actually maybe I shouldn't have said it out loud, <laughs> um, that keeps sending me books to review, this thing that I really want to write for them. But every time I get something, it's you know a black novelist, it's something about you know prisons, um, it's, you know, it's the editor would say to me, you know, I have something else urban to give to you, and I've refused every single one of them. In a sort of sentiment, I said, I want to re you know, review Louis Edrick's you know, book of poems. I'm like, oh, not now. Or you know, give me the new biography from Jane Jacobs. And so I've you know, we kept having this back and forth until finally a few weeks ago I said, weeks ago I said, you know, I feel like I'm, you know, I want this a plantation, but it would have been too hostile. Um, but I said, I feel like I'm on this farm in a, in a, <laughs> that you just throw me in a, in a certain in a limited amount of food, and I just I just want to be eating what everybody else outside is eating. So I said, yeah, I got to rip down that fence. I'm going to jump over the fence and go elsewhere where they give me that food. But I, I don't want to be reviewing. You know, you know why does always I get the black book, you know, and I'm the black reviewer. So I said, you know, I'm sorry. So part of it is m you know me denying in a certain narrow, reductive, reduced, um, you know, claustrophobic, frankly, you know, you know. In the identity, in it, in it, in it, thrown to me. But it is to affirm, you know, you know, something in you know, a broader and richer, you know, not merely about myself, but in you know, about in you know, others. And so, you know, you know, as a writer, you know, you know, writing and you know, showing people with the many different identities, you know, that swirl in them, the many different ways of thinking and of you know being in the world, is one way also, you know, uh, you know of doing that, you know, of saying. You know, I mean, it's like the, you know the old, you know, 
people at Lucy who clipped in one said, because they call you that name, it doesn't mean you have to answer to it. Um, and so it's you know representing people in you know the wide panoply of you know what they are, and that's one way to make some inch towards you know achieving some of that. One of the things that Emily said earlier, and she's quite right, is that um, Baldwin was not a terrific poet. I wish he had been Lucille Clifton. <laughs> like Lucille Clifton was a terrific poet, and there's something continuous about the artistic vision of the two of them. Um, had Baldwin succeeded as a as a poet, he might have become Lucille Clifton. Yes, sir. Racism's effect on you and what it's like, what the experience is. But I wonder, in somewhat historicizing it and even localizing it, racism to America, limiting it to America, and talking about two different phases possibly of racism, the racism that Baldwin might have been experiencing the last strong expression of, and the one that we might be experiencing now. The, the last one I would call the racism of the master class, of the dominant group, the dominant white group. Uh, I think that form of racism, it's not gone, but its it's certainly been weakened. I think that what we're seeing now is a racism of the falling uh, working people who, and that racism has always been there in some form or another, but I think it's more prevalent now. And I wonder if the different quality of the source of the racism is what gives the peculiar flavor of it in our time, or is it just because the effect is the same, it is the same. Or, or do you disagree entirely with that dichotomization of racisms in our own nation? That, would you object and say, no, they're essentially the same? I had the um, privilege of living in Amsterdam briefly while I was pregnant with my first child. It, was, it wasn't briefly, it was for six months. Um, and while Holland is a very progressive nation in many ways, um, in terms of um, gay rights, um, sort of liberalism of a certain kind, they are very backwards compared to us in terms of being articulate about acknowledging um, racism and their role in their role in in, in slavery, um, in the slave trade, and it it was actually shocking to me to live there and 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 hear the things that people were, felt free to say. Um, in my company, not not knowing that I identify as black and, and mixed race, um, just the blatantly racist things, I, I felt quite shocked and disturbed. And I and it was the first time I thought, oh, you know what? We're we're further along in the United States, mm. at least in terms of our language, like, than I than I understood. At least there is a sort of um, embarrassment or degree of shame. Um, about articulating some of these the, these racist thoughts that we have achieved, I think largely because of um, public struggles that we've undergone, political uh, assassinations that we've like national ruptures in our psyche, the death of Martin Luther King, the fact that we have a national holiday um, where we celebrate his life and his dream, um, and, and and the achievements of that movement in spite of the many failure, in spite of its many failures, um, that we still have an incredibly segregated school system, perhaps more so than back then. Um, I mean to say structural racism persists, and I wish there were more time than we're, we're allotted to talk about um, the ways that structural racism has remained extremely entrenched 
um, and unadulterated in this country, in spite of the fact that I think on a, on a surface, or perhaps deeper than the surface, we have learned not to speak in certain ways um, because it's not politically correct to do so. It would be shameful to speak in certain ways that I, that I think they are speaking quite openly um, in places like, uh, like, like Holland and, 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 and throughout Europe where they're dealing with um, uh, immigration and encounters with people black and, and otherwise from nations that, are, that they feel threatened by, right? that the ways that they talk seem shocking to, to us, I think, as Americans, because we've learned um, to a degree because of, because of movements that we've been through and struggled for to at least um, know that we should acknowledge the humanity of black people. And yet, if you look, if you look, at, <laughs> if you look at the structures of the way our nation is operating, it's, 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 as, if, it's as if we haven't moved the needle very far very far. Um, I could go on, but I won't. In, in part of my thing is I have been here as an immigrant and I'm still at the two decades trying to wrap my brain around this country. <laughs> and every time I think I figured it out, it veers and said, gotcha. Um, well, I don't even think it's me as an immigrant. I think it's about every American in the field that they're in one big gotcha the past year. Um, and I'm, I mean, I think for instance of my friends, I have a lot of friends who are from the Caribbean who are always saying, oh, I mean, friends who live in the South who said, I love living in the South because, you know, there the racism is more frank, you know, where you stand, you know, you know, I, I hate being in the North because it's hypocritical and, you know, you just, you just never know where you stand with people. Now, a whole bunch of them now are having regrets the past year who said to themselves, actually, I think I prefer when people keep their opinions to themselves. <laughs> and so, you know, and I've, I've been getting like tons of this, these conversations the past year. And I said, all this to say that the way I've thought about it rather than thinking about the different shifts in, a, in America writ large, you know, I've tried time and again to, as much as I can, particularize it. That I think, you know, we've benefited, you know, immensely from the work of sociologists and historians. You know, been you know thought hard and thought you know about you know to these structural things. But even when I have them hovering in my head, generally when I start on the page, I start trying to say, what are the particularities, you know, of this street, this spot, this place? So even in the essay I wrote for this, I spoke about what it was like being in Kingston versus being in New Orleans versus being in New York, or for instance. Um, when I'm in New York walking, many times I'll ask a white friend to accompany me, or I've walked in partners with women who are continually harassed. I mean, I don't think anybody experiences like you know public harassment or have to be on that high alert to talk about being a you know black man, you know like the way women are. And it's a very strange alertness where you know you're in high alert, you know like you're hyper alert until you reach a certain age where men feel that you know you're no longer worthy of the attention and you become invisible. Mm -hmm. So you're either hyper visible or you're invisible. But they're continually on this sense in, a, in the alertness, and so I have partners I walk with that, you know, you know, I give them solace and they give me solace that we feel more safe in each other's company. But that same walking partner, like when I'm doing that in, let's say, Utah, Alabama, or Baton Rouge, the kind of hostility that comes my way because of the sense that I'm in an interracial relationship is, you know, so when I'm walking, I'm like, I'm walking with a black woman, I'm walking with. In a, in a a white guy, I'm not walking a white you know woman in certain in you know, neighborhoods there, and so it's fascinating you know even in you know you just have to just jump on the flight you know and just go three hours, and it becomes very different. And so I see you know depending on where you're you know regionally, it it feels like plus cachage, like you know more of the same, or you know other ways in which it feels you know you know very different. And so I think of it more, or the way you know I think of in a race, I continually, in my imagination, always hovering around with fears, and I see it in terms of you know how does fear work out in this part of the country, and what are they you know you know how does fear couple with disaffection, um, and anxieties in this part of the country, and then that shapes you know you know the way I move, but also the way I you know I, I try to write about the place. Well, 
Kelly, you said something I thought was really profound and very simple. I'm a writer. I like really simple language. I used to be a journalist. You said you feel as if we're living in a nightmare loop. Mm -hmm. So that means it's happened before, it's happening now, it's going to happen again. Break the loop. How are we going to get out of it? <laughs> <laughs> we, a lot of us keep living with the problem and have. And things are better now than they were 50 years ago and even 25 years ago. But how are we going to make it better for my son and your children? Break the loop. Canada. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I, I'm I love their prime minister. I'm sorry, all for that. In light of your question. Sorry. <laughs> Let me think of something more constructive than Canada. <laughs> um, would that we had to answer wholly at this table, um, but, and I don't mean to speak, f I don't know if the question was addressed specifically to Emily. Um, I wonder if, um to 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 lift the line from from king i guess we are in dire need of a revolution of values and i think to the degree that we continue to f we continue to um, demean and dehumanize others, we will remain caught in a loop. I think getting out of the loop requires a greater courage than um, we may have at the moment. It requires a greater honesty than we may have at the moment, it requires a kind of self-examination, which we're not ready to have, it seems. Um, and finally, I guess, um, I, I've, I've underscored the several times in my, in my seminar, I've underscored the several times that Baldwin seemed to um, characterize our um, American uh, condition as adolescent and it seems to me that he was quite right about that so there's a certain cultural you know and all of this is very abstract I realize um, and I don't know that I have anything more concrete to offer um, except a hope that um, we'll we'll perceive and see our adolescence as a nation and develop the will to grow out of that. Um, I think that's as much as I have at the moment, but I'll, we should all keep thinking about this, obviously. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wanted to, in answering your question, return to the, the word that um, Professor Wallace raised earlier, with, which is love. and. Your question also reminded me of um, a passage in Down at the Cross, Part of the Fire Next Time, that I was rereading on the plane coming down here from New York City. Um, he's talking about the Negro problem. Negro problem. I guess it's, it's difficult to answer your question because part of its premise is that, you know, what, what, what can we do? There's a lot of pressure that the solution rests with us. And I think that's problematic, right? So here's Baldwin on this. Um, there, f there appears to be a vast amount of confusion on this point, but I do not know many Negroes who are eager to be accepted by white people, still less to be loved by them. They, the blacks, simply don't wish to be beaten over the head by the whites every instant of our brief passage on this planet. White people in this country will have to, will have quite enough to do in learning how to accept and love themselves mm -hmm. and each other. And when they have achieved this, which will not be tomorrow and may not 
and may, and may very well be never, the Negro problem will no longer exist for it will no longer be needed. I'm just going to read that last part one more time. White people in this country will have quite enough to do in learning how to accept and love themselves and each other. And when they have achieved this, which will not be tomorrow and may very well be never, the Negro problem will no longer exist for it will no longer be needed. I, I was trying to unpack that because I think it's very profound and very true that he's acknowledging the sickness mm. rests elsewhere, right? I can speak personally for me, like what I can do, and, and, and he said Canada as a joke, right? For me, for me, the most liberated I feel personally, the most free, the most, um, the largest sense I have of, of love, like with with my own life, with my own possibilities, my most, um, it, it is a feeling I get when I travel. And I know that that is not something that everybody has access to in their lives. But I think part of the blessing and the benefit of travel is getting beyond this problem and even recognizing its relationship to similar problems elsewhere. Um, and the ways that we are required to required to love others. Um, that's all I have to say about that for now. I'm, it's hard enough to even get me to tell you what I'm going to do this evening, um, which is, in a, in a way, so de in a dealing what feels so often like an intractable problem. And often when changes happen, I was like, oh, gee, like there's a certain amazement. Um, sometimes I'm even embarrassed, embarrassed at amazement that you know, I keep trying to propel through by hope, but when changes do happen, I'm often more surprised than not when someone gets called to justice for some horrible thing inflicted, you know, like on a black teenager, I'm I'm shocked, at, oh, d there was justice, no, you know, gee whiz, look at that. And so I'm reluctant to say, you know, what can be done. I do know one thing which I've seen time and again and again and again and again have been effective. Um, and I think is absolutely important whether it's effective or not is bearing witness. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we do it in one way as writers, but I think that's part of the whole attraction in a, in a, of social media, at least where issues of you know justice you know, has been concerned, is the ways in which it bears witness, the ways in which somebody can go, ah, you too, or oh, I didn't know, the ways in which it can be like the grandmother Baldwin was talking about to say, you know, there, look, if you, you know, you know, you know, you know, protestations of innocence or of ignorance, you know, are without merit, you know, you can, you, know, you can speak to her. But I keep, you know, two things again in my mind over and over again when I try to write and bear witness, because there's a way to bear witness. And I have Baldwin's line and I have Auden's line. Um, two, you know, um, well, two, you know, gentlemen and a fictional character from Alice Walker novel where Alice Walker had this matriarch in her book, Meridian, and time and again she kept saying, make room for the fool in everybody. And so I keep thinking about it, make room for the fool in everybody, to try to, to write, not assuming bad faith, that somehow the, the words will connect. Um, and even if you're not agreeing, it, sort of make room for the fool in everybody. But Auden's line, you know, um, you know from his poem, you know, you know, walking out one evening, is like, love your crooked neighbor with your crooked heart. So also the sense that you know, even in you know, you know, making our protestations, is to not make it seem that you know, you know, we're all in a from place of full in a in a sense that that there are ways in which, you know, you know, our perceptions are other things can be clouded. But love you, crooked neighbor, your crooked heart, and Baldwin's you know remark that, you know, you know, we have not stepped trembling yet, but if we had not loved each other, and this remark was fascinating. He goes, none of us, none mm -hmm. of us would have survived, and so to write. Um, with a sense, in you know, a capacious sense of you know, of our, what other people's humanity, mm -hmm. and to write to reveal you know that um, you know with that hope that you know people seeing you know our full humanity, but also recognizing that you know that they're seeing themselves in us, um, and so to deny us as to that their very selves, I think is one one of the most powerful ways of sort of adding that spark to hope and you know. You know 
grasp it is some kind of change no matter how small. And I guess my question is, um, do you think it's worth it to engage in an argument with <coughs> someone who is so actively trying to not listen? Or do you think that it's a matter of traveling, it's a matter of personal experience, it's a matter of getting outside of your environment that you were brought up in? Or do you think that there is value in trying to engage in that conversation? And if so, what is the best way of going about that through this voice of love and not um, creating an angry tone that would set people off to what you're trying to say? There was a study done over the summer about, um, did you see this? A study done this summer on, on topic of social media and race um, and the amount of posts um, about race, whether we're talking about Facebook or Twitter or, 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 or whatever, um, that there may be a kind of problem in so far as um, those of us who um, have social justice cons concerns related to race, maybe sort of preaching to the choir by circulating our own, you know, like circulating posts or opinions among people who already share them, um, which may also be a result of that our our um, our social media spheres may also be uh, quite segre segregated in the ways that our um, schools and and and, chur and churches <laughs> remain quite segregated, right? Um, but uh, and seeing that, I, I I had to reflect. Oh, it it made me quite sad. It made me reflect on my own personal. Um, friendships, right? The times, for example, this summer when it felt like human civilization was falling down to me, um, to have, for example, s certain white friends um, posting a, a picture of what they had eaten for dinner, um, y you know, on the, on the heels of, uh, of another black person being, being shot, um, rather than having them engage with, um, with that event or or respond to the pain that I and other of my friends or family had articulated to that event uh, about that event when I saw this study I realized oh it may be that they're not even seeing they're not even accessing or witnessing um, the the kind of um, family table that Jasmine was describing she had to turn to through social media to uh, move through her grief um, about Trayvon Martin, to, which generated this book, right? So I, I, I think that um, that study piqued a lot of uh, converse, conversation. It provoked a lot of conversation, actually, about, uh, I think, among people who use social media um, who may feel, uh, well, I want to say something or I want to participate in this conversation, but I'm afraid of offending people in my in my friend group or in my family who may think that I'm being um, angry or, 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 or hostile or they may disagree with my views. But I think it's really important, as, Bal as Baldwin is actually saying and pushing for, like part, part of this um, forward momentum has to be in the court, uh, it, it, not just in our court. Um, so you, you see recycled um, some of the slogans in, in Black Lives Matter protest movements that pop up here and there. Some of the slogans you see are recycled from the civil rights movement and some of them are new. And one of them that I've seen, and I don't know if it's new or old, is white silence is violence. And I and I and I think that's something to to think about. If you, if you are active in social media, you have you have a voice too. And although it may feel like you're taking a risk in articulating or sharing or posting an opinion or an event um, that may enrage and anger you or hurt your heart, because maybe you feel it 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 you will be perceived as 
something by somebody in your friend group or family group who doesn't share your beliefs, I think you need to, to risk being brave. Um, I'm asking you to risk being brave because I think it does matter. That's the, that's the, the courage I was sort of alluding to earlier on that I don't know we are um, inclined toward, um, not least because none of us wants to be the outlier, all of us want to belong. And I think that's a legitimate desire to want to belong. Um, but I also think that um, that courage is a form of honesty. It's a form of transparency that only grows the people around us. I'm still kind of stuck on the earlier question about what to do. How do we get out of the loop? And um, I know that we identified um, the value, the merit of hope. And I do think hope is valuable, but I think hope is finally our motivation, not quite the answer. Um, and that the answer may well involve, if I keep thinking on it, the, the answer may involve um, a kind of honesty where Americans come to own their fears mm -hmm. about the future, about where we are, and then also recognize that we already and have always belong to each other even when we were denying it. And to the degree that race is part of that denial, um, I think we have to recognize that we need each other and we, we're we related. <laughs> we're kinsfolk. Uh, and that's a reality that race pretends to deny um, or that race intends to deny because we're committed to these pure genealogical lines that don't tell the truth about who we are and um, how tied not only our past is but how inextricably tied the future must be if we're going to be at all. I have a new practice now when I write emails to people I'm upset with. <laughs> I have the everything blank except what I have to write save it and I come back like a day later because <laughs> I've had a few moments in which I sent off emails and people were like this can't possible who wrote this you know who hacked you and so there's some people who shouldn't be on Twitter I'm one of them <laughs> and so I'm the kind of person who I would quickly lose my fellowship here at UVA if I had a Twitter account because I will go in at 3 o'clock in the morning and let you know what I think <laughs> And I'm up at three o'clock in the morning. Um, you and Don. There, yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> Don't trust the people who are on Twitter at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and so I shouldn't be on Twitter, but I think I should be a writer. I think giving myself over to reflection and continually having my own writing beat my back up and show ways in which I've fallen short mm -hmm. and uh, I'm forced to reflect and think and withdraw. It's important. But there are people who need to be on Twitter and you met with one of them. And so there is no one way to bear witness. There is no one way to um, fight. Um, but what is you know, required of all of us is to you know, respond with, a, you know, with an honesty, with a willingness um, not to just go along with the crowd, um, but to say you know, you know, not only what you know, can be said, but what should be said. Um, and there's also importance in preaching to the choir. I mean, you don't want a funk band you know, talking to the choir. You, you pretty much want a pastor talking to the choir. And so sometimes the choir needs somebody you know, with a sense of vibrancy and coherence to, you know, to remind them that, okay, we're not going to be singing sexual healing this morning. We're going to be singing <laughs> in, a, in, a, in the garden. Um, and so you know, there is... A, an importance in talking to people who are like-minded like you um, and also pushing them to to expand you know, their moral and political imagination. 
Um, and then again, and, you know, as Emily had pointed out, that you know, and Bowen, you know, did that. There is also a certain, I mean, like, especially if like, if you're black, you know, you sort of sort of get like racial anew. You know, what I mean, there's a certain point. I mean, it, it it gets old fast with somebody calling you to say, "Hey, come be on this panel. Um, we need like we need a we need a black perspective." You know, or somebody can say, "Oh, we need some African Americans." I'm like, well, "Why don't you call one? I'm from Jamaica." Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, you know, and so we also, you know, need, you know, you know, people who are, you know, you know, talking to, you know, to others to say, you know, you know, you know, hear experiences that, you know, you know, we're not, you know, paying due enough attention to hear people who are unlike us, you know, in the way they look, but unlike us in these other, other ways. And we need to expand our, you know, moral imagination to, to think of them, to to treat them with full dignities, and to also, you know, you know, fight for them. I think one of the most rich things I've seen, at least, you know, with these protests and these marches, at least in New York, is you know, standing and seeing, you know, you know, Filipino grandmothers and you know, Hispanic, you know, you know, working class men, and um, you know, Russian, um, you know, you know, yuppies, you know, it's all together, you know, you know, you know, marching and you know, insisting on the rights of people who. You know, you know, look nothing like them, and who maybe even displaced. You know, um, you know, from them in so many experiences, but you know, who are all in solidarity together and get it together around. You know, the sense that, you know, there are people who are being denied denied dignity merely because of their complexion, merely because of the color of the skin.